As the sun dipped low on the horizon, painting the sky with hues of red and gold, the distant silhouette of Troy emerged, a dark shadow against the fading light. The young warlord Achilles stood at the helm of his ship, the sea breeze ruffling his golden hair and the salty air filling his nostrils. His polished armor gleamed bronze, catching the sunlight in a dazzling display of power and prestige. His helmet, adorned with a majestic horsehair plume, cast a shadow over his face, leaving only his piercing eyes exposed. They burned in anticipation of the impending war, the clash of bronze against bronze, and the blood-soaked soil that awaited. Around him, the Greek armada stretched as far as the eye could see, a formidable force of warships, each carrying fearless warriors eager for glory. Among them were Agamemnon, the commander of the armada, and his younger brother Menelaus, king of Sparta, whose stolen wife, Helen, had ignited the flames of this epic conflict. Menelaus stood amid his men with his gaze fixed upon the towering city, his red hair glowing like a crown of flames, eager to regain his stolen honor. He was unaware that the siege of Troy would last ten long years, and it would be 18 years before he saw the shores of his home again. The conflict which would ensue outside of the walls of the Bronze Age city of Troy would provide the material for the epic poem which would shape the very foundation of Western civilization, Homer's Iliad. Just as the Bible provided a unifying and founding text for the Israelites, which allowed them to form their identity in a shared history, the Trojan War, as recounted in Homer's Iliad, would become an identity-defining reference point for the Greeks and the many Western peoples which followed. For the Greeks, the Iliad provided a contrast between West and East, between us and them, and a pantheon of heroes in whom they found kinship and from whom they claimed divine descent. In many ways, the Trojan War was the first event in Western historical consciousness and it would go on to frame the history of the West for thousands of years to come. From the Greco-Persian Wars and Alexander the Great's conquest of Asia, to the Frankish and Aquitanian repulsion of the Muslim forces in the Battle of Tor. On the plains of Troy and in the poetry of Homer, the spirit of the West was born. More than 3,000 years after the events of Homer's Iliad, in the waning light of a Turkish spring day in 1873, a man named Heinrich Schliemann stood on the windswept plains near the Aegean coast. His eyes were set on a mound of earth which he believed concealed the ancient city of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann was not a traditional archaeologist. He was a self-made millionaire who had amassed his fortune through various business ventures yet his heart belonged to the study of the ancient world, and his mind was consumed by a singular vision, the discovery of the lost city of Troy. At the age of just seven, Schliemann had declared that he was going to discover and excavate Troy, and it had been his determination to do so ever since. Schliemann meticulously studied ancient texts, maps, and geographical descriptions to determine the most likely location for the city of Troy. He eventually settled on Hisarlik, a hill in modern-day Turkey, as his chosen excavation site. Though his efforts were met with skepticism from the academic establishment, who dismissed his theories as flights of fancy, in March of 1871, Schliemann began his excavations. After weeks of backbreaking labor, Schliemann's pickaxe struck something hard beneath the earth. As the dirt and debris fell away, the outline of a massive stone structure emerged, a defensive wall built layer upon layer over centuries. As Schliemann dug deeper into the layers of his Sarlik, he uncovered evidence that he believed corresponded with the descriptions in the Iliad. Fortifications, gates, and walls were revealed, and burnt debris and weaponry suggested a city that had endured a violent conflict. As he continued to excavate, Schliemann discovered a hoard of gold and silver artifacts, which he referred to as Prime's treasure. This cache of precious objects, including jewelry, vases, and a diadem, which Schliemann dubbed the Jewels of Helen, captured the imagination of the public. 
Soon, headlines read that Schliemann had discovered the lost city of Troy. Over the next 20 years, Schliemann conducted a series of excavations at Hisarlik, revealing the city's ancient layers one by one. Schliemann's work led to the identification of nine distinct layers, each reflecting a different era of the city's existence. Schliemann would also conduct other digs in Greece, uncovering the funeral shafts at Mycenae, and in them, the golden funeral mask which he famously called the Mask of Agamemnon. Thanks to the dream which had gripped Schliemann as a boy, the lost city of Troy, once thought to be the stuff of myth and legend, had been resurrected from the sands of time. But even more important than the discovery of the actual city was the proof that the myths and legends of the Greeks, once thought to be pure fiction, were based upon historical fact. The historical reality of the Trojan War was still up for debate. However, this would change after the translation of Hittite records attesting the Trojan War. The Hittites were an ancient Anatolian people who established a powerful kingdom centered in modern-day Turkey during the Late Bronze Age. The most crucial Hittite records related to the Trojan War come in the form of a diplomatic correspondence known as the Ahiyawa Letters. The term Ahiyawa is believed to correspond to the very same Achaeans or Mycenaeans who laid siege to Troy in the pages of the Iliad. The Ahiyawa letters contain references to various political and diplomatic exchanges between the Hittite Empire and the Ahiyawa state. They discuss matters such as the release of prisoners, disputes over territory, and requests for military assistance. The Hittites also mention interactions with a land called Wilusa, which many scholars believe to be an Anatolian rendering of Ilios or Ilium, the ancient name for Troy. One of the most intriguing Hittite records is the Tawagalawa letter, which contains a reference to a figure named Tawagalawa, who has been linked by some scholars to the Greek figure Ateocles, a name mentioned in the Iliad. The Hittite records when considered in conjunction with the other archaeological findings and ancient texts, contribute to the growing body of evidence which suggests that the events of the Iliad, though perhaps embellished, did in fact take place in the Late Bronze Age. As the prow of Brutus's ship cleaved through the waves, the salt-laden winds carried whispers of destiny. The land that stretched before him was unlike any he had ever seen, a land of rugged cliffs and emerald hills, cloaked in fog. Once, Brutus's great-grandfather, Aeneas, had taken to the sea in search of a new home for his people, as his city, Troy, burned behind him. According to Virgil, he would find this home on the Italian peninsula, and unite the Latin and Trojan peoples, giving birth to the Roman bloodline. But the young explorer Brutus had his eyes set on even remoter lands. As he took the first step on unfamiliar soil, and damp fog kissed his cheeks, he knew what he would call this strange new continent. He would name it Britain. The legend of Brutus of Troy gained prominence in medieval England, thanks in large part to Geoffrey of Monmouth's The History of the Kings of Britain. This influential work narrated the mythical origins of Britain, asserting that Brutus, the great-grandson of Aeneas, had founded the island. The myth of Brutus provided a captivating origin story for British royalty. Medieval monarchs, including King Arthur, were often depicted as descendants of Brutus. Among the noble families who claimed descent from the heroes of Troy was the House of Troyes in France, who traced their ancestry back to Aeneas through his son Ascanius, as well as the House of Stuart in Scotland, whose claim rested on the belief that Banquo, a legendary Scottish king mentioned in Shakespeare's Macbeth, was a descendant of the Trojan hero Brutus. Modern scholars have questioned the historical accuracy of these narratives, and yet before Heinrich Schliemann, no serious historian would have dared to assert that Homer's Iliad contained within it as much historical fact as myth. Although it may seem unlikely that a genetic connection existed between the Trojans and the aristocratic lineages of medieval Europe, the influence of the Iliad on medieval European culture is undeniable. 
Just as the ancient Greeks had, they traced their lineages back to the heroes who fought at Troy. In medieval chivalric literature, Achilles served as the quintessential example of valor and martial prowess. Knights and heroes aspired to emulate his unmatched courage on the battlefield. In the mind of the medieval European, the Trojan War and the heroism of Achilles were still fresh. The Iliad is the oldest text to mention Achilles. Greek myth tells us that Achilles was born to the goddess Thetis and the mortal Peleus, making Achilles a demigod. Zeus had been pursuing Thetis, but after coming to learn of a prophecy that any son born to Thetis would surpass his father, Zeus married her off to the mortal king Peleus. The story of Achilles gaining invulnerability after being dipped in the river Styx was a later invention, first mentioned in Statius' Achilliad, written in the 1st century AD. Yet in the Iliad, Achilles' semi-divine nature makes him nearly invincible. In the opening lines of the epic, Achilles is described as Dios Achilleos, the Greek Dios meaning divine or godlike, sometimes translated more literally as shining or brilliant. In Book 1 of the Iliad, Agamemnon, the leader of the Achaeans, seizes Briseis, a young woman given to Achilles as a war prize. To take vengeance on the Achaeans for his wounded pride, Achilles departs from the war effort to sulk by his tent. Without their best fighter, the war soon turns in favor of the Trojans, and a despairing Agamemnon sends Odysseus, Telamonian Ajax, and Phoenix to appease Achilles and beg him to rejoin the fight. Achilles rejects the prizes which Agamemnon offers him, saying, Cattle and fat sheep can all be had from the raiding, tripods all for the trading, and tawny-headed stallions, but a man's life breath cannot come back again. No raiders in force, no trading brings it back, once it slips through a man's clenched teeth. Mother tells me, the immortal goddess Thetis with her glistening feet, that two fates bear me on to the day of death. If I hold out here and I lay siege to Troy, my journey home is gone, but my glory never dies. If I journey back to the fatherland I love, my pride, my glory dies. True. But the life that's left me will be long. The stroke of death will not come upon me quickly. Achilles says that he will return home, choosing the second option, and urges his fellow Achaeans to do the same. Since Achilles will not join the fight, his dear companion Patroclus puts on his armor, hoping to strike fear into the Trojans and drive them back. But the inferior fighter is killed by the Trojan Hector. Patroclus' death forces Achilles to confront his own mortality, and sets off a chain of events which ultimately lead to Achilles' death. Achilles' mother visits him as he sits sorrow-stricken on the beach. Thetis answered, warning through her tears, You are doomed to a short life, my son, from all you say, for hard on the heels of Hector's death, your death must come at once. Then let me die at once, Achilles burst out, despairing, since it was not my fate to save my dearest comrade from his death. Achilles' desire to avenge Patroclus' death by killing Hector causes him to reverse his earlier position on his fate. Mourning Patroclus, Achilles refuses to eat and drink with the other Achaeans as they feast in preparation for the next day of fighting. Achilles' fast acts as a ritual of mourning, but also serves as a symbolic defiance of death. By refusing to eat, Achilles is rejecting the fact that he must rely on food and drink to keep him alive. Thus, Achilles seeks to resist the weakness which makes him mortal. Yet looking down from Olympus upon the mourning Achilles, Zeus sends Athena to nourish him with the food of the immortal gods. Achilles' consumption of nectar and ambrosia marks his entry into a godlike state. With his body strengthened and clad in the armor which Hephaestus forged for him, Achilles embarks on a partial and temporary ascension to godhood. Achilles now, like in human fire, raging on through the mountain gorges, splinter dry, setting ablaze big stands of timber, 
the wind swirling the fireball left and right, chaos of fire. Achilles storming on, brandishing spear like a frenzied god of battle, trampling all he killed, and the earth ran black with blood. Achilles is often described as godlike, but here he is described as equal to a god, translated more liberally by Fagels as like a frenzied god of battle. By eating of the food of the gods, Achilles temporarily becomes like the gods. Achilles' physical ascension towards godhood is accompanied by a total loss of mercy. Achilles has no regard for the lives of mortals, or the laws of common companionship and brotherhood with man. When Lycaon, one of Priam's sons, throws himself before Achilles and begs for his life, Achilles kills the unarmed man without remorse. As Achilles tosses Lycaon's lifeless body into the river, he says, Make your bed with the fishes now. They'll dress your wound and lick it clean of blood, so much for your last rites. Nor will your mother lay your corpse on a bier and mourn her darling son. Die, Trojans, die, till I butcher all the way to sacred Troy. Run headlong on, I'll hack you from behind. Nothing can save you now. Achilles' power has grown so great that even after the gods who live forever have returned to Olympus, Achilles slaughters on and on, never pausing. At last, only Hector, the great hero of Troy, stands in its defense. Achilles engages Hector in single combat, and, using his knowledge of the slain Patroclus' armor, which Hector is wearing, Achilles pierces Hector through the neck. Hector, immobilized in the dust, begs for mercy, but Achilles replies, There are no pacts between lions and men. No friendship between wolves and lambs. Once Achilles has avenged Patroclus' death by killing Hector, and thus also sealed his own fate, he eats and drinks with the other Achaeans. For Achilles, this marks a return to a state of mortality. Yet Achilles is still resisting his mortality by refusing to bathe himself or bury Patroclus. When Achilles gives in to sleep for the first time since Patroclus' death, the ghost of Patroclus visits him saying, Sleeping, Achilles, you've forgotten me, my friend. You never neglected me in life, now only in death. Bury me, quickly, let me pass the gates of Hades. Never, never again will you and I, alive and breathing, huddle side by side apart from loyal comrades, making plans together. Never, grim death, that death assigned from the day that I was born has spread its hateful jaws to take me down. And you too, your fate awaits you too, godlike as you are, Achilles, to die in battle beneath the proud, rich Trojans' walls. But one thing more, a last request. Grant it, please. Never bury my bones apart from yours. Achilles, let them lie together. By agreeing to bury Patroclus' bones alongside his own and allowing Patroclus to pass into Hades, Achilles accepts Patroclus' death and resigns himself to his own mortality. The story of Achilles would inspire generations of Western men, including Alexander the Great, who slept with a copy of the Iliad under his pillow and would dedicate his life to following in Achilles' footsteps. With the superhuman deeds of a young king who set out thousands of years ago upon the waves of the Aegean in search of glory and riches in foreign lands, the spirit of the West was born. And in the pages of Homer's Iliad, this spirit and the bloody, glorious struggle which forged it would be immortalized forever. Imagine that you are a Dorian youth looking with your warband over a moonlit Minoan city. Its citadels, once proud and gleaming, are now hidden behind battle-worn, defensive walls. You grip your spear, imbued with the confidence that you have come to impose civilization upon these cities and all their decadence. The return of the sons of Heracles, or the Heraclids, was the myth which the ancient Greeks had about Hercules' banished sons returning to Greece to conquer its cities and take their rightful place as its ruling caste. 
The Spartans believed that they were the descendants of these Heracles, and that they had the blood of Hercules, and therefore of Zeus himself, flowing through their veins. In this episode, I want to talk about the Spartans, the problem of civilization and nature which they represent, and the centrality of the barbarian in the rise and fall of civilizations. I will discuss how the conquering barbarian brings with him the return of nature, since the barbarian has been shaped by nature, while the civilized man has lost his nature in the comfort of civilization. And most importantly, I will prophesy the return of the sons of Heracles in modernity. In Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche wrote, To be sure, one must not resign oneself to any humanitarian illusions about the history of the origin of an aristocratic society, that is to say, of the preliminary condition for the elevation of the type man. The truth is hard. Let us acknowledge unprejudicedly how every higher civilization hitherto has originated. Men with a still natural nature, barbarians in every terrible sense of the word, men of prey, still in possession of unbroken strength of will and desire for power, threw themselves upon weaker, more mellow civilizations in which the final vital force was flickering out in brilliant fireworks of wit and depravity. At the commencement, the noble caste was always the barbarian caste. Their superiority did not consist, first of all, in their physical, but in their psychical power. They were more complete men, which at every point also implies the same as more complete beasts. At the foundation of every society, and at its end, we find the figure of the barbarian. The very birth of civilization arose, and subsequently has always arisen, from a barbaric, nomadic ruling caste imposing themselves upon a more civilized, sedentary population. And when these civilizations eventually fall, there have always been barbarians at the gates who had retained their nature and were ready to impose themselves upon the crumbling civilization and start the cycle afresh. This cycle of rise and fall, this dance between the barbarian and the civilized man, is caused by the very nature of civilization, which distances man from nature, and by alleviating the pressures of nature, causes his own inner nature, his own instincts, to weaken, to grow lethargic, undisciplined, decadent, nihilistic. Therefore, once civilized for a number of generations, the barbarian lacks the energy, the will, the vital force to sustain the civilization which his once barbaric and disciplined nature created. And we can see this cycle playing out very clearly in the history of civilization in the Mediterranean. The Minoans are the first civilization which we know of who dominated the Mediterranean. Excavations on the island of Crete have unearthed the sophisticated palaces, the frescoes, and the advanced urban planning of the Minoans. And from the layers of destruction in the archaeological record and the apparent abandonment of certain sites, we know that Minoan centers experienced a decline during around the 15th century BCE. During this decline, the Mycenaean civilization of the mainland rose in power, giving rise to the world of the late Bronze Age, which we see in the pages of Homer. We call this age and this civilization Mycenaean because of the ruins of Mycenae, which Agamemnon rules over in the Iliad, and because the site seems to have been a center of power for the Mycenaeans. However, in the Iliad, the Greek forces are referred to as the Achaioi, or Achaeans, as well as the Danoi, or Danans, and the Argaioi, or Argives. These last two names are given in accordance with the Mycenaean city of Argus and its mythical founder, 
Danaos. Therefore, I'm going to use the word Achaean to denote Mycenaean civilization, since it's easier to distinguish from Minoan and it seems to be more historically accurate. Achaean palaces displayed architectural similarities to the Minoan structures, but they also had their own distinctive features. And the Achaeans used the same early Greek language as the Minoans, known as Linear B. The Linear B documents, notably from Pylos and Knossos, give us insight into the Mycenaeans' administrations, their economic activities, their religious practices, and these documents point to the assimilation of the Mycenaeans, of the Achaeans, into a pre-existing culture of the Minoans. All of this fits perfectly with the narrative which we receive in the myth of Theseus. Imagine a ship setting sail into the ink-black waters of the Mediterranean as Theseus, a young hero, gazes back at the moonlit port of ancient Athens. He is one among seven young women and young men sent as a tribute to King Minos of Crete every seven years. They are intended as a sacrificial offering to the Minotaur, a creature born from the unnatural union of Minos' wife and a bull. On the sea breeze, Theseus already feels that he can smell the stench of the wretched half-man, half-bull, wafting from the corridors of the labyrinth beneath the halls of Knossos. But for Theseus, already a renowned hero, the name of the Minotaur does not instill fear in him, but rather a lust for the taste of blood and for the thrill of combat. In the myth of Theseus, Theseus is the barbarian, conquering and subjugating the civilized Minoans who are represented by the Minotaur. Yet the myth portrays him as a bringer of order and civilization who is subjugating a chthonic, subterranean beast. This is how the barbarian views himself, and how we have received history through the myths of the Indo-Europeans. From the Olympians and Aesir subjugating the Titans and the Vanir, to Zeus, Thor, and Hercules conquering various serpents and subterranean creatures. The barbarian does not see himself as uncivilized and barbaric, but rather as a bringer of civilization and of order. The tribute of youths sent to Crete may echo the historical reality of a Minoan tribute system which would have been imposed on Achaean territories. It could represent the actual historical seizure of Achaean youths either for some sort of sacrificial ritual, perhaps to a bullheaded Minoan god, or maybe just as slaves and as servants. But either way, the myth clearly reflects the hegemonic control exercised by the Minoans over the Mediterranean at the time. The Labyrinth of Knossos likely represents the intricate palaces and architecture of the Minoans, and it may also be symbolic, more broadly, of the complexity and sophistication of the Minoan culture that the Mycenaeans, or the Achaeans rather, would have encountered during their expansion. Theseus' victory over the Minotaur then would represent the emerging dominance of the mainland Achaean powers over the Minoan centers. Theseus' romance with Ariadne, the daughter of Minos who helps him navigate the labyrinth, likely reflects what we see in the historical and linguistic record, that the transition from Minoan to Mycenaean or Achaean civilization was not a simple conquest, but a process of cultural synthesis and coexistence as much as one of conflict, of conquest, and of rapid expansion. In the myth, after killing the Minotaur, Theseus, along with the other Athenian youths and Ariadne, escape Crete and return to Athens. However, Theseus forgets to change the black sails to white on his ship as a sign of victory, and this causes his father, King Aegeus, to believe that his son had perished, and to throw himself into the sea in despair, giving it its name, the Aegean. Therefore, we see that the sea is given an Achaean name, which may be thought of as symbolic of the Achaeans' conquest of and claim over the entire Aegean and its islands, which were once centers of Minoan power. 
the Mediterranean, which was once the domain of King Minos, is now a Chian territory, named after the king of Athens. And Athens, which once had to pay tribute to Crete, is now freed from the terror of the Minotaur. Just as the myth of Theseus appears to represent a dramatized version of historical events, could the Spartans claim that they descend from Heracles also be based upon historical reality? The world of the Spartans was not the Greece of Homer's Iliad. The civilization of the Achaeans, just like that of the Minoans before them, would decline and fall during what is known as the Greek Dark Age, which was around the 12th century BC. This Dark Age was part of a larger Bronze Age collapse, which you've probably heard of, and marked the transition from the Greece of the Bronze Age to the world which we typically refer to as Ancient Greece, the world of Athens and of Sparta. The Greek Dark Age is marked by a gap in the historical record where written evidence is scarce. The Linear B script used by the Mycenaeans disappears and the Greek language undergoes a series of changes that give rise to the Greek alphabet and to Homeric or Epic Greek, as well as the dialects of Attic, Aeolic, and Doric, which was notably spoken by the Spartans. The once mighty palaces and urban centers of the Achaeans, like Mycenae, lay in ruins. The pottery styles and architectural features gradually vanished from the landscape, and this period witnessed a simplification of material culture, with smaller settlements replacing the grandeur of the Mycenaean citadels. The Greek myth of the return of the sons of Heracles was associated with this Bronze Age collapse. The myth says that after Heracles' death, his sons faced persecution from Eurystheus, the king of Mycenae, and his supporters. To escape this threat, the Heraclids were forced into exile, that is, the descendants of Hercules were forced out of Mycenaean Greece. The sons of Heracles sought guidance from the oracle at Delphi to determine their destiny and the oracle prophesied that the return of the sons of Heracles was fated to occur after a period of oppression and hardship. Under the leadership of Heracles' son Hylas, the sons of Heracles led a series of military campaigns which allowed them to successfully capture the Peloponnese and establish themselves as the rulers in different states within the region. This myth and the belief that the Spartans were descended from the Heraclids is widely attested in both mythic and historical sources, and ancient Greek historians such as Thucydides and Herodotus considered this myth to be based upon real historical migrations and conflicts. The archaeological record seems to indicate that there was indeed an invasion or a migration which either led to or contributed to the decline of Achaean civilization, just as had happened to the Minoans. During the Mycenaean decline, the Achaeans were building defensive walls around their cities and leading to nearby water sources, indicating that by this time they were under the threat of constant attack and siege. They were living in fear. Taking all of this into account, it does seem likely that the Spartans were part of a broader movement of Doric-speaking peoples into the Peloponnese. This theory has traditionally been called the Dorian Invasion, and posits that one of the Greek tribes, the Dorians, migrated into the Peloponnese, bringing their Doric dialect with them, and contributing to the collapse of Mycenaean civilization and the establishment of a new political order in various Peloponnesian cities. The most compelling evidence for the Dorian invasion may be just how foreign the Spartans seemed to the other Greeks, the Spartans were extreme isolationists and considered themselves to be superior to the other city-states. They behaved much more like an occupying force than a native people. Integration and intermarriage with conquered peoples, which seems to have been a common practice among most Indo-European ruling castes in Europe, was not practiced by the Spartans. The Spartans kept themselves strictly apart from the local populations which they had conquered. Their society was structured around a rigid social hierarchy. There were the Spartiates, who were born of Spartan parents, 
They were the warrior class, highly trained and dedicated to military service. There were the Perioikoi, who were free inhabitants of the Spartan-controlled territories surrounding the city, and they served as craftsmen, merchants, and in various support roles. And then there were the Helots. The Helots were state-owned serfs, subjugated to Spartan rule, who provided agricultural labor. Their treatment was extremely harsh in part due to the fact that it is estimated that there were three times as many helots as there were Spartans, and the Spartans were therefore in constant fear of revolt. Central to the Spartan way of life were eugenic practices that aimed to produce the strongest and most capable warriors. The Spartans viewed mothers as playing a crucial role in rearing strong warriors, and considered the death of a mother in childbirth to be just as honorable as the death of a warrior on the battlefield. This view contributed to the Spartan women enjoying a much greater amount of freedom and equality than the women of other Greek city-states. And this is another aspect of Spartan life which the Athenians viewed as foreign and barbaric. This again is more evidence for the idea that the Spartans came from outside of Greece, where exactly we do not know. Ancient sources tell us that at birth, infants were inspected by state officials, and if the baby displayed any physical deformities or weakness, it was deemed unfit to become a Spartan citizen and was exposed and left to die, typically on a hillside. This was not uncommon in ancient Greece, but it was not practiced systematically in any other city-states. Spartiates from the age of seven underwent an intensive training regime known as the agoge. This training was designed to create disciplined, physically fit, and fearless warriors, and was yet another avenue for eugenic selection. Only the Spartan youth who excelled in physical training and displayed mental fortitude were admitted to higher levels of the agoge. The Spartan boys would live in communal barracks, and their education was overseen by older youths. They underwent grueling exercises to develop their strength, agility, and endurance, and they were trained in the art of phalanx warfare, and apparently also in the art of dance, which would help increase coordination and agility. The boys were given only a cloak, no shoes, no bedding, and they were expected to steal or hunt for their food, which would force them to be crafty and intelligent. All of these hardships were designed to toughen the Spartan youth and prepare them for the rigors of war. The Spartans shunned material luxury. They only ate something called black broth, allegedly, which doesn't sound very good, and they refused to use money. Luxury and wealth were discouraged, and so were the arts, and therefore Spartan poetry and philosophy is scarce, and the primary focus was on military training and physical fitness. For this reason, the accounts of Spartan practices may in fact be exaggerated, either by the authors or by the Spartans themselves, who sought to project an image of fearsome military might. For example, Plutarch writes that Spartan husbands and wives were forbidden to live together. The men and the women lived separately and were forced to have sex in secret in order to keep their marriages exciting. He also writes that strict monogamy was considered shameful since the Spartan state did not want to exclude the possibility of a fruitful coupling. It is possible that all these things, though a bit humorous and outlandish, are in fact true, but it is also possible that they are rumors and exaggerations, since the Spartans were extreme isolationists. Even if exaggerated, the harsh Spartan discipline and the belief that they were the rightful masters and rulers of the Peloponnese by divine descent, by birthright, is characteristic of the aristocracies formed after a barbaric, nomadic people has conquered a local, agriculturalist population. The barbarian, who has been shaped by the harsh pressures of nature, by the difficult and warlike life of the nomadic pastoralist, recognizes the importance of applying artificial pressures to himself in order to maintain the strength of his inner nature in civilization. In fact, the barbarian recognizes that the very purpose of civilization is that it allows him to apply pressures to himself and to gather resources to himself 
which the nomadic lifestyle would not allow. To use a concrete example, we can look at the effects of civilization on the body. When living in nature, either a pastoralist or hunter-gatherer lifestyle, the pressures of daily life will keep you fit and healthy. You will not look like a bodybuilder, of course, but you will be strong, you will be lean, and generally you will have a beautiful body. Sometimes people will try to counter this idea by pointing to tribes who live in very hot environments and tend to be overly lean, even emaciated, but this is an adaptation to an extreme environment, just as the Eskimos, for example, tend to carry more fat. But as a general rule, life in nature, as a pastoralist, as a hunter-gatherer, hunting, fishing, riding on the steppe, will apply pressures to your body, which will make it beautiful and healthy. This is especially true of pastoralist peoples, whose nomadic lifestyles were especially rigorous and whose diets were of particularly high quality. When comparing the skeletons of the pastoralist Indo-European invaders with the native agriculturalist populations of Europe, we can see, as expected, that the farmers had much worse health. This is because agriculture is the first step towards mitigating the pressures of nature, it is the first step on the path towards civilization. The skeletons of the European agriculturalists, the Bronze Age farmers, were small. Their bones were thinner, their teeth crooked, all a result of their softer, less nutritious diets, and a more sedentary lifestyle. Instead of spending hours in the saddle or hunting in the mountains, they would spend hours in the field. This is representative of the great danger of civilization more generally. Without the pressures of nature, man loses his own inner nature. His body, his instincts, his will, his vitality begin to atrophy. This is why it is vital to impose artificial pressures upon yourself in civilization. For example, going to the gym so that your body does not become fat, soft, and weak. The great advantage of civilization is that it allows you to actually surpass the potential which you have in nature. Again, bodybuilding is a great example of this. If Steve Reeves or Arnold Schwarzenegger or Mike Menser were in a hunter-gatherer tribe, they would likely all have been great warriors, but they would not have been able to achieve the beautiful bodies which they got through bodybuilding and of course the use of steroids their potential would have been limited. The genius Alexander, Caesar, Goethe, Nietzsche is not possible in nature. It is the excesses and the wealth of civilization which allows them, like the flower of a great tree, to muster all of the resources which the trunk provides and to blossom. The fruit of civilization is genius and excellence, far surpassing anything found in man's natural state. In other words, his state as a hunter-gatherer, as a tribesman, or as a nomad. And I call these states natural because they are the default states of existence for man as an animal. They are how man has lived for hundreds of thousands of years, and how we would resume living if we were, for example, dropped on another planet with little resources and no memory of agriculture or civilization. So now let's get back to the Spartans. The Spartan way of life, might makes right enforced by law, is often considered by people to be a kind of state of nature, a return to nature, an unleashing of the forces of nature. But from what we've just discussed, we can see that the Spartans' extreme practices were not in fact natural. The Spartans were not practicing the laws of nature, but rather a form of hyper-civilization. They used the state and the resources which they collected from the great population which they ruled over to put more pressure upon themselves than they would have received in nature, and to select for a specific goal, the creation of a caste of superior warriors. In nature, many of the babies which the Spartans exposed probably would have survived. The Spartans used the state, they used civilization, and the resources which they acquired from the great population which they ruled over, to put more pressure upon themselves than they would have received in nature, and to select for a specific goal, the creation of a caste of superior warriors. And this was accomplished. 
While the Spartans did not contribute much to Western material or literary culture, their role in the Greco-Persian Wars was crucial in preserving Greek culture and even the sovereignty of Europe as a whole. Quote, Go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here, obedient to their laws, we lie. End quote. This is the inscription that the Spartans left at the site of Thermopylae, where King Leonidas and his 300 warriors, knowing that they were soon to be surrounded and slaughtered by Persian forces, laid down their lives to give the rest of the Greek forces time to retreat and regroup. When Xerxes sent a messenger to tell Leonidas and the Spartans to lay down their weapons, Leonidas replied, Come and take. To this day, we remember the Spartans as great warriors, and in America, we fly the words of Leonidas, Malon Labe, come and take, on flags, marked with the Spartan helmet. The problem with the Spartan model, if I may offer a criticism, is that it is too restrictive on an individual's freedom. Their laws were aimed strictly at creating warriors, and they accomplished this, but at the cost of much else. The Spartans created no Alexanders, no Plato's, no great conquerors or poets. Almost all of their energy was devoted to training for war, ensuring that the helots did not revolt, and putting down the revolts when they did. This allowed them to brag that they needed no walls, their shields were their walls, but it also, in a certain sense, subverted the very purpose of civilization. Civilization provides a foundation to prop up great individuals, it provides the conqueror with an army, the king with a kingdom, the artist with chisel and brush, the poet with pen and paper, and thus it allows the creation and enactment of great civilizational projects. But in order for the vision of the genius, of the superior individual, to be realized, he must have a certain freedom to enact his will and to use the resources of civilization as he pleases. To summarize, the purpose of civilization is the cultivation of individual and collective greatness, which allows man to be overcome, which allows man to create something higher than himself out of himself. Civilization allows for the cultivation and enhancement of the raw material of nature. But the great danger of a civilization comes when a society does not allow for this when nature is not preserved within civilization and within man, then civilization falls. Then the barbarian, who still has his nature, sweeps in to conquer the declining civilization and start the cycle afresh, just as Theseus and the Achaeans did, just as the sons of Heracles did, and just as I believe will soon happen again. Of all the civilizations which we know of, we have strayed farthest from nature. We have isolated ourselves from nature, within and without, distanced ourselves from our instincts, and lost them in the process, and thus forgotten what life truly is. We have forgotten nature, not just forgotten, but actively sought to eradicate her, to force her into the caves of the earth, as Oronos did to the giants, the offspring of Gaia, and to force nature within us into the darkest crevices of our minds and souls. And for this greatest of all offenses, this greatest of all sins, this supreme hubris, we are being punished and our civilization is crumbling before our eyes. As Nietzsche prophesied, man himself is withering and diminishing before our eyes. I too will end this episode with a prophecy and an appeal. You sons of Heracles, you who still have the flame of nature within your chest and the spirit of the barbarian in your heart, it is up to you to cultivate nature within yourself, to strengthen nature within yourself, and to become the barbarians at the gates of this crumbling civilization. It is up to you to carry on the torch of nature, for civilization is nature harnessed and elevated. It was Prometheus who first harnessed the power of fire, of raw nature and will, and out of it birthed the arts of civilization. 
And it was Heracles who freed Prometheus from his chains when Zeus sought to force him back into the depths of Tartarus. Here is my prophecy. The sons of Heracles are returning again, sweeping down from the cold heights of the mountains, rising up from the frothing waters of the seas, and it will be their will which shapes the next cycle of civilization. And here is my appeal. Become the sons of Heracles, my brothers. Stoke the flames of nature within your heart and strive to become like that great son of Zeus who harnessed his violent nature to accomplish great labors. Strive to become a master of this earth and to birth a generation of heroes like the earth has never seen. I would rather live a short life of glory than a long life of obscurity. This is an apocryphal quote attributed to Alexander the Great, and while it has no historical source, I believe that these words are more faithful to Alexander's character than anything quoted by historians. Alexander sought to follow in the footsteps of Achilles, and famously slept with a copy of the Iliad under his pillow. Yet the achievements of this young Macedonian king would far surpass those of the Bronze Age warlord who he sought to emulate. Alexander the Great would become the golden standard by which men like Caesar and Napoleon would measure themselves. And despite their great accomplishments, it is my belief that Alexander's achievements have remained unmatched. It is said that Julius Caesar once wept before a statue of Alexander. Caesar was in his 40s, while Alexander had conquered the known world and died by just 32. A short life of glory indeed. In the life of Alexander, we can get a glimpse of how the myths of figures like Hercules, Achilles, and Odysseus may have developed. If we did not have sufficient historical evidence, would we really believe that a man who claimed to be the son of Zeus conquered all of Asia in just 10 short years? There are many events in Alexander's life which skirt the line between myth and reality. One such example is the Gordian Knot. It was prophesied that whoever could untie it would become master of all of Asia. Alexander, with his usual wit and irreverence, simply cut the knot with his sword. This story I am inclined to believe, but perhaps less believable, though equally awesome, are the dreams which Plutarch reports that Philip, Alexander's father, and Olympias, Alexander's mother, had before the birth of Alexander. In his life of Alexander, Plutarch writes, quote, the night before the consummation of their marriage, Olympias dreamed that a thunderbolt fell upon her body, which kindled a great fire, whose divided flames dispersed themselves all about, and then were extinguished. And Philip, some time after they were married, dreamt that he sealed up his wife's body with a seal, whose impression, as he fancied, was the figure of a lion. Some of the diviners interpreted this as a warning to Philip to look narrowly to his wife, but Aristander and Telmesis assured him that the meaning of his dream was that the queen was with child, a boy who would one day prove as stout and courageous as a lion." End quote. Whether or not you choose to believe this account, I have no doubt that for thousands of years to come, men will still speak of the thunderbolt who set the world on fire, and this is how myths are made. Alexander's father, Philip of Macedon, though overshadowed by his son's legacy, was himself a man to be reckoned with. Using the technology of the Macedonian phalanx, which was an innovation on the Spartan phalanx, which deployed much longer pikes, Philip conquered Athens and Thebes and brought Greece under Macedonian rule. This would prove to be a crucial foundation for Alexander's success. Here we have again a perfect example of the cycle of civilization. The Athenians had long been civilized and their power was waning, but the Macedonians, 
who had long been considered uncivilized barbarians by the other Greeks, swept down from the north to usher in the new Golden Age, which would come about as a result of Alexander's conquests. In 336 BC, during his daughter's wedding ceremony, King Philip was assassinated by one of his bodyguards, Pausanias. The motive, whether personal vendetta or political intrigue, is unclear. The information which ancient historians give us is sparse and contradictory. But one thing was certain. At just 20 years old, Alexander was king. In a series of swift and decisive actions, Alexander eliminated all challengers to the throne, including his own cousin, and had those who were implicated in the conspiracy killed. Thebes took Philip's death as an opportunity to revolt, but Alexander was ready. He had already seen combat at just 16 when he put down a Thracian revolt in his father's absence. Alexander acted quickly to brutally crush the Theban revolt and raised the city to the ground as a warning to others who might also contemplate rebellion. To establish his authority and quell dissent, Alexander embarked on a tour of Macedon, asserting his leadership and demanding oaths of loyalty from various regions and city-states. He then turned his attention to the northern front. The Thracians and Illyrians had also taken Philip's assassination as an opportunity to revolt, but they too were crushed by Alexander. Alexander had quickly proved himself to be a capable and formidable leader. Philip's conquests had laid the perfect foundation for Alexander. Having been tutored by Aristotle himself, and having inherited his father's army, Alexander might be considered the pinnacle, the greatest blossom, the ripest fruit of Hellenic civilization. Aristotle was arguably the pinnacle of Greek philosophy, and the Macedonian phalanx was the pinnacle of Greek military technology, even better than that of the Spartans. So Alexander had at his disposal the best resources of the Greeks. Alexander stands as an example of the very purpose of civilization. All of the might and wisdom of Hellenic civilization came to a point in him. A man who believed that he was the son of Zeus. A man who had his heart set on surpassing the deeds of Achilles and taking vengeance on the Persians for their invasions of Greece. Alexander had not only inherited his father's army and kingdom, but also his vision of a Persian conquest. Philip had harbored ambitions of conquering Persia and had laid the groundwork for a Persian campaign. Such a campaign would have been doubtless motivated by a desire for revenge against the Persian Empire for its two invasions of Greece, led first by King Darius and then by his son Xerxes. Although both invasions were repelled by the Greeks, Xerxes had made it into the heart of Greece, massacring the Spartans at Thermopylae and raising Athens. Such wounds are not easily forgotten, and I'm sure that Alexander, with his admiration of Achilles, brought a further mythic element to this conquest. Like Achilles, Alexander would head east to conquer Asia once and for all, ending the conflict which began with the Trojan War and proving the superiority of the Greeks over their far wealthier adversaries. After Alexander crossed the Hellespont with his army, bridging the two continents as Xerxes had done before him, he met the Persians in combat for the first time at the Battle of Granicus River. In May of 334 BCE, just two years after Alexander had assumed the throne, the stage was set for a confrontation that would shape the course of history. The armies of Alexander stood on the western bank of the Granicus River, poised to engage the forces of the Persian Empire. The Battle of Granicus River would mark the commencement of Alexander's campaign against the Persians, and it would showcase his military brilliance and unwavering ferocity in battle. Arian gives an account of the battle in his life of Alexander. Quote, 
When Parmenio advised Alexander not to attempt anything that day, because it was late, Alexander told him that he would disgrace the Hellespont if he feared the Granicus. And without saying more, Alexander immediately took the river with 13 troops of horses and advanced against the showers of darts thrown from the steep opposite side, which was covered with armed multitudes of the enemy's horses and soldiers. Alexander did this despite the disadvantage of the ground and the rapidity of the stream, so that the action seemed to have more frenzy and desperation in it than any prudent conduct. However, Alexander persisted obstinately to gain the passage, and at last, making his way up the banks, which were extremely muddy and slippery, he fell upon the enemy in a confusion of hand-to-hand -hand combat, while his men were still crossing over. The enemy at once pressed upon him with loud and warlike cries, and charged horse against horse with their lances. After they had broken and spent these, they fell to it with their swords, and Alexander, being easily known by his buckler and a large plume of white feathers on each side of his helmet, was attacked on all sides, yet escaped wounding, though his armor was pierced by a javelin in one of the joinings. Rosakis and Spithridates, two Persian commanders, fell upon him at once, and Alexander struck at Rosakis, who had a good breastplate on, with such force that his spear broke in his hand. While they were thus engaged, Spithridates came up beside Alexander, and raising himself up upon his horse, gave Alexander such a blow with his battle axe on the helmet that he cut off the crest with one of the plumes. The helmet was only just strong enough to save Alexander, and the edge of the weapon only touched the hair of his head. And as Spithridates was about to repeat his stroke, Clytus prevented him by running him through the body with his spear. At the same time, Alexander dispatched Rosakis with his sword. While the horses were thus dangerously engaged, the Macedonian phalanx passed the river, and the soldiers on each side advanced to fight. But the enemy, hardly sustaining the first onset, soon gave ground and fled." End quote. Alexander's actions in this battle would set the tone for his entire campaign. Always in the thick of battle, calculated in his plans yet reckless in his courage, Alexander would go on to win battle after battle, sweeping across Asia, defeating Darius, subjugating the Persian Empire, and taking his army all the way to India. Perhaps the best example of Alexander's daring and recklessness in battle was during the storming of the Malian stronghold in India. Arian writes, quote, When the citadel was seen to be still in the possession of the enemy, and many of them drawn up in front of it to repel attacks, some of the Macedonians tried to force an entry by undermining the wall, and others by placing scaling ladders against it. Alexander, thinking that the men who carried the ladders were too slow, snatched one from a man who was carrying it, placed it against the wall, and began to mount it, crouching under his shield. The king was now near the battlement of the wall, and with his shield, pushed some of the Indians within the fort, and cleared that part of the wall by killing others with his sword. The shield-bearing guards, becoming very anxious for the king's safety, pushed each other vigorously up the same ladder and broke it so that those who were already mounting fell down and made the ascent impossible for the rest. Alexander, standing upon the wall, was being assailed all around from the adjacent towers, for none of the Indians dared approach him. He was also being assailed by the men in the city, who were throwing darts at him from a short distance. Alexander was visible both by the brightness of his weapons and by his extraordinary display of audacity. He therefore perceived that if he remained where he was, he would be incurring danger without being able to perform anything at all worthy of consideration. But if he leaped down within the fort, he might perhaps strike terror into the Indians. And if he did not, he would die honorably after performing great deeds of valor worthy of recollection by men of the future. Forming this resolution, he leapt down from the wall into the citadel, where, supporting himself against the wall, he struck with his sword and killed some of the Indians who set upon him. 
including their leader, who rushed upon him too eagerly. Another man he kept in check by hurling a stone at him, and a third in like manner. Those who advanced nearer to him he had kept off with his sword, so that the barbarians were no longer willing to approach him, but, standing around him, cast at him from all sides whatever they could get hold of at the time." End quote. During this battle, Alexander sustained a severe arrow wound, but his men, following him into the stronghold, saved him from death, and ended up taking the stronghold. This was not the first time Alexander had risked death to secure victory, nor was it the first time he had sustained a near-fatal wound in combat. Alexander was, indeed, as courageous as a lion. In 323 BC, after conquering all of Asia in just 10 years, Alexander, at age 32, fell abruptly ill and died. It is unclear whether the cause was disease or poison, and if he was poisoned, who may have been involved in the conspiracy? Historians are divided on this subject. Alexander's final words and commands before his death are also disputed. According to Diodorus, when Alexander was asked on his deathbed to whom his kingdom would be given, Alexander simply said, to the strongest. Whether or not this is true, it is certain that Alexander failed to secure an heir, leaving his vast kingdom in chaos. Though it is somewhat haunting to think about what Alexander may have achieved if he had lived, he got what he wanted, to follow in the footsteps of his hero, Achilles, and leave behind a short life of glory and an immortal legacy. And it is worth exploring this connection between Achilles and Alexander in more depth. It is almost impossible to speak about the life of Alexander without thinking about the life of Achilles. Though Alexander sought to emulate the deeds of Achilles, and arguably surpass them, Achilles lamented his fate. In the Iliad, when we initially learn of Achilles' fate, either a short life of immortal glory at Troy, or a long life of obscurity at home, he says that he would prefer to live long and humbly. When Agamemnon sends Odysseus, Telamonian Ajax, and Phoenix to bribe Achilles into rejoining the fight, with gifts and flattery, Achilles rejects the gifts, saying, quote, Cattle and fat sheep, tripods and tawny-headed stallions can all be had from raiding, tripods all for the trading, and tawny-headed stallions, but a man's life breath cannot come back again. No raiders in force, no trading brings it back once it slips through a man's clenched teeth. Mother tells me, the immortal goddess Thetis, with her glistening feet, that two fates bear me on to the day of death. If I hold out here and I lay siege to Troy, my journey home is gone, but my glory never dies. If I journey back to the fatherland that I love, my pride, my glory dies. True, but the life that's left me will be long, the stroke of death will not come upon me quickly." End quote. At this point in the Iliad, Achilles clearly argues that one's life is more precious than material possessions. Though he laments the loss of glory and honor, he decides to return home, and urges his companions to do the same. To Achilles, his life is more precious than anything else. He only reverses this position once his friend Patroclus is killed by Hector. When his mother, Thetis, says, quote, You're doomed to a short life, my son, from all you say, for hard on the heels of Hector's death, your death must come at once. End quote. Achilles replies in grief and anger, quote, Then let me die at once, since it was not my fate to save my dearest comrade from his death. End quote. Achilles chooses to stay in Troy and avenge his friend, not for the sake of wealth, power, or glory, but for the sake of honor and brotherhood, for the sake of another life. However, in the Odyssey, when Odysseus summons the spirits of Hades and speaks to Achilles, Achilles laments his fate. 
Upon encountering the shade of Achilles, Odysseus praises his dead companion, saying, quote, But was there ever a man more blessed by fortune than you, Achilles? Can there ever be? We ranked you among immortals in your lifetime, we Argives did, and here your power is royal among the dead men's shades. Think then, Achilles, you need not be so pained by death. End quote. But Achilles replies, quote, Let me hear no smooth talk of death from you, Odysseus, light of counsels. Better, I say, to break sod as a farmhand for some poor country man on iron rations than lord it over all the exhausted dead. End quote. Achilles would rather break sod as a farmhand than be a king among the dead. Wealth and power means nothing to Achilles. His immortal fame gives him no solace. In tragic fashion, Achilles suffers most from the very thing which made him great. His greatness was his destruction. Achilles' divided attitude towards his fate reveals a fundamental tension between two strains in the Western tradition. On the one hand, the desire to live a humble life of virtue with a Spartan simplicity, rejecting material wealth and the desire for personal fame. And on the other hand, the desire to be celebrated as a god, to rush headlong towards death and destruction, and to immolate oneself in a fire of glory, like Hercules. The origin of this divide can only be guessed at. Does it arise from the union of two separate traditions? perhaps one of Indo-European origin and the other from the European farmer populations? Or is this dichotomy essential to the tragic tension which is central to the European vision of the heroic ideal, the hero who suffers from his fate, the hero who must choose between happiness and greatness, the demigod who must struggle with his mortality and his divinity and ultimately choose between the two? This tension was evident in Alexander's life. Alexander's men thought poorly of him when he began to adopt Persian custom and allow himself to be venerated and treated as a god. Arian reports that Callisthenes, a man who had studied philosophy under Aristotle, refused to prostrate himself before Alexander, saying, quote, I openly declare that there is no honor which Alexander is unworthy to receive provided that it is consistent with his being human. But men have made distinctions between those honors which are due to men and those due to gods." End quote. The tension between the values of equality, humility, and brotherhood between men, and the desire for glory, immortal fame, and deification has always defined the West, and still does to this day. I've referred to this as the struggle between equality and excellence in the soul of the West. The same Roman Republic which hated monarchs gave rise to Caesar, and Caesar to Christ. In his histories, Herodotus explores this tension at great length. In fact, it might even be considered the central issue of the histories, or at least the central issue of his recount of the conflict between the Greeks and the Persians. Herodotus writes that when Xerxes held a war council to decide whether he was going to invade Greece, Artabanus, one of the Persian nobles, advised Xerxes against it. Artabanus says, quote, Do you see how the god hurls his lightning at the outsized beasts and stops their proud displays while the smaller creatures bother him not at all? Do you see how his bolts fall without fail on the biggest houses and trees? Thus does the god diminish all things outsized. In the same way, too, a great army can be destroyed by a smaller one." End quote. Herodotus' warning and his theory of history and life, given through the mouth of Artabanus, is clear. Zeus strikes down mighty beasts with lightning so it is with empires and kings. Though both Achilles and Alexander chose a short life of glory over a long one of obscurity, Achilles lamented his fate, thinking longingly of a long and humble life out of the sight of the gods. But Alexander, in his courageous recklessness and lust for glory, looked to the heavens and said, 
let the lightning strike me. I will end this episode with the words of Alexander himself, as recreated by Arian. After almost ten years away from home, the same span of time which Achilles spent at Troy, Alexander's men refused to go any further. What follows is an excerpt from Alexander's famous mutiny speech, which he gave in response to his men and their attempted mutiny. Quote, Someone may say that while you endured toil and fatigue, I have acquired these things as your leader without myself sharing the toil and fatigue. But who is there of you who knows that he has endured greater toil for me than I have for him? Come now, whoever of you has wounds, let him strip and show them, and I will show you mine, for there is no part of my body, in the front at any rate, free from wounds, nor is there any kind of weapon used either for close combat or for hurling at the enemy whose scars I do not bear. For I have been wounded with the sword in close combat, I have been shot with arrows, and I have been struck with missiles projected from the engines of war. And though oftentimes I have been hit with stones and bolts of woods for the sake of your lives, your glory, and your wealth, I am still leading you as conquerors over all the land and sea, all rivers, all mountains, and plains. I have celebrated your weddings with my own, and the children of many of you will be the kin to my children. Most of you have golden crowns, the eternal memorials of your valor, and of the honor you received from me. Whoever has been killed has met a glorious end, and has been honored with a splendid burial. Brazen statues of most of the slain have been erected at home, and their parents are held in honor, being released from all public service and from taxation. But not one of you has ever been killed in flight under my leadership. And now I was intending to send back those of you who are unfit for service, objects of envy to those at home. But since you all wish to depart, depart, all of you. Go back and report at home that your King Alexander, the conqueror of the Persians, Medes, Bactrians, and Sakians, the man who has subjugated the Uxians, the Aracotians, and Drangians, who has also acquired the rule of the Parthians, Chorasmians, and Hyrcanians, as far as the Caspian Sea, who has marched over the Caucasus, through the Caspian Gates, who has crossed the river Oxus and Tanais, and the Indus besides, which has never been crossed by anyone else except Dionysus, who has also crossed the Hydaspes, Akesines, and Hydraotes, and who would have crossed the Hyphasis if you had not shrunk back with alarm, who has penetrated into the Great Sea by both the mouths of the Indus, who has marched through the deserts of Gedrosia, where no one ever before marched with an army, who on his route acquired the possession of Carmania and the land of the Eritians, and in addition to his other conquests, his fleet in the meantime sailed around the coast of the sea which extends from India to Persia. Report, when you return to Susa, that you deserted him and went away, handing him over to the protection of conquered foreigners. Perhaps this report of yours will be both glorious in the eyes of men and devout in the eyes of the gods, depart." End quote. Though Alexander's legacy is as of yet unsurpassed, I believe that the time of Alexander's is not yet over, for though the earth may be conquered, its farthest reaches explored and populated, far above us the stars patiently await. Aristos is the ancient Greek word for nobility, and it means superior or best. And this drive to prove one's superiority in all capacities through the pursuit of arete, that is excellence, was at the core of the ancient idea of heroism and virtue. The word aristocracy comes from the word aristos, literally aristos meaning the best and Kratos meaning power, in aristocracy, the best, the most noble, the most beautiful, the most intelligent, the strongest 
hold power. But this ancient conception of aristocracy is nothing like the idea of meritocracy, which is thrown around on the right a lot. You hear people like Jordan Peterson talk about this. For me, meritocracy invokes a cheap kind of intelligence and industriousness, a one-dimensional schoolboy intelligence. The Greeks did not admire Achilles because he got good grades in school and knew how to follow the rules. They admired him because he was dios, which in ancient Greek means godlike, or literally shining or brilliant. The Greeks admired Achilles because he shone with beauty, power, nobility, and a manifest superiority. He was a demigod. Physically and spiritually, he shared kinship with the gods. This is what gave him the right to rule. In ancient times, aristocracy was based upon the idea of divine descent and kinship with the gods. The idea that the nobility descended from the mythic heroes of the Bronze Age and therefore from their divine parents. The Heraclids, for example, claimed the right to rule in Mycenae, Sparta, and Argos, tracing their ancestry back to Heracles and through him to Zeus. This idea of the divine right to rule continued into the Middle Ages, but in modernity, when discussing the idea of aristocracy and aristos, I think we can replace the idea of the divine and the divine right to rule with the idea of nature. I think in a certain sense, the word nature for us is equally mythical as the idea of the divine and fulfills a similar role to the gods who are also forces of nature. We use the word nature to refer to so many different things, to the totality of existence and the forces which animate it, the laws of physics, but also to nature in the stricter sense of biological life, of plants and animals and people, and then of instinct, someone's inner nature, someone's inborn nature. We invoke nature in a similar way to which the ancients invoked the divine. For example, when we say, you can't change how nature made you. You know, you're only four feet tall, but that's how nature made you, and uh, nature is cruel and unfair. Or when we say, someone won the genetic lottery, which of course isn't a lottery at all, we are invoking the idea of being blessed by genetics, being blessed by nature and biology. If you make the right choices, if you live correctly and with virtue in the ancient sense, nature will reward you with beauty, intelligence, strength, vitality, even with success and riches. And it is the same on a generational level and on a societal level. If you have a clean diet and avoid the toxins which are so prevalent in modernity and craft yourself the body of a beautiful Bronze Age athlete, if you walked into Sparta, they might say, this man is blessed by the gods, surely he is the descendant of a demigod. But today, we might say, you are blessed by nature. Nature is rewarding you. That vital force which animates biological life, which is contained within you, is rewarding you for making the correct choices and for living virtuously. I have named this podcast the Aristos Podcast because I believe that this ancient concept best represents what we on the right, the true right, the ancient right, represent. The values of beauty, strength, intelligence, and human excellence. The value of quality over quantity, and the creation of higher forms. This is all contained within the ancient idea of aristocracy. The modern left has become a cult around the promotion of ugliness, weakness, and deformity, of sick life, of life bred from generations in the societal zoo which we have created. The modern left hates beauty, strength, and excellence because they make the inherent inequality of humans, the inherent inequality contained within nature and biology, plainly evident. Every once in a while you'll see an article pop up about how fitness is far right, or the admiration of beauty and strength is somehow inherently fascist. But from the ancient aristocratic perspective, the inequality inherent in nature and in humans is a good thing. And rather than seeking to level this inequality and drag everyone down to the lowest denominator, 
the doctrine of aristocracy says that we should promote the exceptions and hold them up as the ideals for all to strive for. The true meaning of aristocracy is the belief that the beautiful, the strong, the intelligent, those courageous and bold in action, noble and honorable in character, those lucky hits of the species, as Nietzsche called them, those blessed by the gods, as the ancients said, or blessed by nature, as we say, justify and elevate our species. All of this is contained within the word Aristos. Now that my intro ramble is over, I want to speak to you a bit about Homer, morality, and nature, using a short piece by Dominique Venner called The Homeric Triad. He writes, quote, For the ancients, Homer was the beginning, the middle, and the end. A vision of the world and even a philosophy are implicitly contained in his poems. Heraclitus summarized his cosmic foundation with a well-turned phrase, The universe, the same for all beings, was not created by any god or by any man, but it always was, is, and will be eternally living fire. End quote. And by the way, you can find this piece for free online if you just look up Dominique Venner, the Homeric Triad. Venner is positing that the foundation of Homer's world is the ever-changing cyclical world of nature, which is indifferent to human affairs. He elaborates on this idea in the first section of the piece, called Nature as the Foundation. Quote, In nature, in its imminence, here and now, we find the answers to our anguish. Quote, As leaves are born, so are men. The wind scatters the leaves on the ground, but the forest is green again in the spring. So too with men. One generation is born as another is erased. The Iliad, Book 6. The wheel of the seasons and life, each transmitting something of itself to those who will follow, thus assures a measure of eternity. End quote. For the ancient Greeks, nature was indifferent to human affairs. Men are born and then tossed aside like leaves by the whims of nature and destiny. But also in nature we find a divine, enchanted world which answers our sorrows with the glimpses which it provides into eternity, into the secrets of nature and the divine. This is what I discussed in the second to last episode of the Bridges to the Superman series in the Hymn to Demeter, which talks about the myth of Persephone in Dionysus, and then in the kind of paganized vision of Christ. So go watch that if you want to hear more about this. The next section of Venner's piece is called Excellence as the Goal, and here he discusses the idea of arete, of excellence, and the ancient Greek desire to be the best, and to leave behind a name which will echo through the ages, and thereby acquire undying immortal fame. I think this quote from the Havamal, a Norse text, perfectly illustrates the Greek view. Quote, Cows die, kinsmen die, the self must also die. But I know one thing which never dies, the reputation of those who have died. End quote. For the ancient Greeks, this immortal fame, which is assured only through the memory of men, was their only chance at immortality and it was more important to them than their lives, which come and go like leaves in the winds of time. But there is a caveat to this. The heroic desire to be the best comes with preconditions. It is not the desire to win at any cost or at the expense of one's dignity. The third and final section of Venner's piece is titled Beauty as the Horizon, and here he argues that to the Homeric hero, even dearer than immortal fame and being the best, was living with honor. This is from a previous section, but it illustrates his point well. He writes, quote, What does not pass away is interior, within oneself, in the truth of one's conscience, to have lived nobly, without baseness, to have remained in accord with the model one has set, end quote. As Venner points out in this final section, Homer's world is a tragic world. 
characters are undone by their excess and their flaws. In fact, the greater the vitality and exceptional excellence of the character, the greater their flaw and excess and the greater their undoing. This is why there are no happy ends for the great heroes of ancient Greece. In the final chapters of the Iliad, the closer Achilles ascends towards godhood, the more violent and inhuman he becomes, and the more he brings about his own undoing. It brings to mind Nietzsche's idea of going beyond, his encouragement of those who would pursue the Superman to embrace extremes and excess, to go under and over, as he says, and by this path to achieve greatness. Venner writes, Homer's heroes are not models of perfection. They are prone to error and excess in proportion to their vitality. For this reason, they fall under the blows of an imminent law that is the wellspring of Greek myth and tragedy. Every fault carries punishment, that of Agamemnon like that of Achilles. But for Homer, innocence can also be suddenly struck by fate, like Hector and so many others, because no one is safe from tragic destiny. This vision of life is foreign to the idea of a transcendent justice punishing evil or sin. In Homer, neither pleasure nor the taste for battle nor sexuality is ever likened to evil." End quote. In the face of the indifferent forces of nature, fate, and death, all that is left to a man is to act in a way which will be remembered a way which will bring him glory and honor and which will make his name echo through the ages. Quote, the virtues praised by Homer are not moral but aesthetic. He believes in the unity of the human being defined by his style and his acts. Thus men define themselves with reference to the beautiful and the ugly, the noble and the vile, not good or evil. Or to put it differently, the striving for the beautiful is the condition of the good. But beauty is nothing without loyalty or bravery. Thus Paris cannot be really beautiful because he is a coward. He is only a fop who deceives his brother Hector and even Helen, whom he seduced by magic. On the other hand, Nestor, in spite of his age, retains the beauty of his courage. A beautiful life the ultimate goal of excellence in Greek philosophy, of which Homer was the paramount expression, supposes the worship of nature, the respect of modesty, Nausicaa or Penelope, the benevolence of the strong for the weak, except in combat, the contempt for baseness and ugliness, the admiration for the ill-fated hero." End quote. For the Greeks, beauty is the condition of the good. If one achieves power through deceit and wickedness rather than the merits of their own abilities, rather than through their manifest superiority, they have lost their nobility and honor. Better to die nobly than to live as a coward. And here we can see the reason for Achilles' famous choice. After Agamemnon takes Achilles' woman, Briseis, after Achilles' honor is slighted, he is disenchanted with the war. He decides to sail home and urges his friends to do the same. He scorns material wealth. He finds his life much more precious. And remember, this is after 10 years of sieging Troy. Achilles says, forget this, forget all this fighting for material goods. Achilles is a king after all and has no need of material goods. What he is pursuing is honor. Kleos, which means glory gained in battle, but this is denied him by Agamemnon. His honor has been taken away, and he has been forced to play second to the king. Therefore, he says, forget this whole glory thing. I'm going to sail home. But when his friend Patroclus is killed, avenging Patroclus' death is a thousand times more important to Achilles than his own life. It's also interesting to keep in mind that when Hector killed Patroclus, Patroclus was wearing Achilles' armor, and thus Hector also slew 
the image of Achilles. He slew his pride, he slew his glory. So in avenging the death of his friend, Achilles is also redeeming his image and his glory. And thus we can see that while Achilles values his life more than material goods, what is most important to him is glory, honor, pride, kleos, the striving for arete, the drive to be the aristos, the best, to live nobly, to live freely, to live with courage, and to have his name remembered. So, so far we have established that to the Homeric heroes, material wealth is of little meaning. It is simply an indicator of the kleos, the glory which one has gained in battle. What is most important to the heroic hero is to be the aristos, to be the best, to strive to be superior to all other men. And yet it is important that this is done with nobility and with honor. And yet to return to the beginning of Venner's piece, Nature as the Foundation, we see that it is always evident in Homer that these codes of morality, of virtue, these codes of conduct are external and constructed and imposed upon nature. They arise from the pact between men which is in no way inherent to the world. Many times in the Iliad, warriors will refuse to fight each other because of pacts of friendship made by their ancestors, by their great-grandparents. A Greek warrior will recognize a helmet or a sash which his great-grandfather bestowed upon his Trojan opponent's great-grandfather, and so they'll stop the fight to converse and tell stories of their ancestors, and they will then refuse to fight each other. These incidents are pretty funny to read, and they reveal to us that the morality or codes of conduct at play here are based upon the bond of kinship and upon the host-guest relationship, upon the oaths of hospitality, and upon the bonds of blood and brotherhood. This is why genealogy has always been so important to the European tradition, and why even in the Middle Ages, as I talked about in my last video on the Trojan War, they traced their lineages back to the famous heroes of the Iliad. And yet again, beneath all this, there is always that awareness that the codes of honor and kinship are imposed upon nature, not inherent to it. Beneath the laws of men, beneath the veneer of constructed society, the laws of nature are absolute and they are indifferent to the affairs of man. When Achilles is in his divine rage, nourished by nectar and ambrosia, he completely tosses aside the laws of men. When one of the Trojans asks for mercy and says, please don't kill me, ransom me instead, Achilles says, nope, you're dead. He kills him and he says, you're gonna have your grave in this river with the fishes. Your mother will never see your corpse again and you will not receive a proper burial, which again was very important to the Greeks. And he says, I'm going to slaughter my way all the way to Troy, hacking people down from behind. He has shed his humanity in this godlike state. As Nietzsche wrote, everything which is higher is also immoral. When Hector asks for mercy, Achilles says, there can be no pacts between lions and men, and there can be no peace between wolves and sheep. Here, Achilles is appealing to the absolute ruthless laws of nature which lie beneath the constructed laws of men. In this line, Achilles reveals the truth about nature in Homer. Nature has no mercy. Might makes right. Morality is imposed and constructed. This sentiment is echoed in the fragments which we have from the pre-Socratic philosopher Antiphon. In fragment 44, Antiphon says, quote, Justice, then, is not to transgress that which is the law of the city in which one is a citizen. A man, therefore, can best conduct himself in harmony with justice if, when in the company of witnesses, he upholds the laws. 
and what alone, without witnesses, upholds the edicts of nature. For the edicts of the laws are imposed artificially, but those of nature are compulsory. And the edicts of the laws are arrived at by consent, not by natural growth, whereas those of nature are not a matter of consent." End quote. This is essentially what Achilles is saying to Hector in that famous line, the laws of men, the laws of mercy and of combat are arrived at by the consent of men. They are imposed upon nature, but beneath those laws, the ruthless law of nature is absolute and nature has no mercy. And Achilles has the ability to disregard the laws of men, which are artificially constructed. Throughout the Iliad, the scenes of violence are described with exquisite beauty and extended nature metaphors. These are actually some of the most beautiful parts of the Iliad to read. Some of the metaphors compare warriors defending the fallen corpses of their comrades to lionesses defending their cubs. On the battlefield, predators and prey struggle for survival and supremacy. The whole violent yet beautiful drama of nature is played out on the battlefield. Again, to return to Venner's analysis of Homer, nature, brutal and beautiful, is the foundation of this world. The immutable laws of nature are what are revealed when the veil of civilization is pulled back. So now we come to the question of what is reality on the most basic level, and the question of moral worldviews versus natural worldviews. In Christianity, the world is moral. You live within a fundamentally moral world. The metaphysics of the world are divided between good and evil. They are based upon morality. Whereas in Homer, this is not the case at all. Everything takes place within an amoral world, the world of nature. And good and evil exist, although not in the Christian sense, but morality and virtue exists within this amoral world. Our modern worldview in the West, the liberal worldview, as well as leftism, conservatism, etc., are all moral worldviews. Our modern worldview in the left, the liberal worldview, as well as leftism, conservatism, are all moral worldviews, and they are all based to some degree in Christianity, or at least heavily influenced by it. Even the most conservative Republicans, although they may aim to do it by economic means, aim at moral progress, the alleviation of suffering, the improvement and lengthening of life for mass man, the utopia which negates and levels the laws and inequalities of nature. Anyway, I talked about this at length in the final video in the Bridges to the Superman series, but I think it is important that you understand that everything we discuss today in politics and philosophy is based in a moral and progressive worldview. No one questions the fundamental goal of a utopia which alleviates suffering and levels the hierarchies of nature. Conservatism is based upon liberal enlightenment values and so is the liberalism of the establishment left in America and Europe. Leftism is based in Marxism, but Marxism, although it is anti-Christian, is a related ideology, at least to early Christianity, and it aims at utopia, the comfort of the masses, the leveling of nature's hierarchies, etc., etc. But no one on the right or the left questions whether this is a worthy goal in the first place. No one brings in the question of quality. They assume, as Christianity does, that mere life, mere existence has value. Yet in Achilles' choice of a short life of glory over a long domestic life of comfort, we see a refutation to this claim. And we have to understand what Achilles is really sacrificing here. Achilles would have been around the age of 20, give or take, when he set sail for Troy. So after the 10 year long war, he would be in his late 20s or early 30s. By choosing to avenge 
Patroclus, Achilles gives up the possibility of ever seeing his home again, of ever seeing his father again, of ruling as a king for many long years, of enjoying the wealth and glory which he acquired at Troy, of having children, of having many more adventures and battles. Achilles is giving all of this up to live with nobility. He values the quality and character of his life above all else. Achilles' choice, which stands at the very center and the very foundation of ancient Greek civilization, and therefore of Western civilization, perfectly encapsulates and illustrates the path of higher life, of aristocratic life, which chooses to seek excellence and quality above all else, with, as Venner said, beauty, and I might add freedom and courage and nobility as the condition of this excellence. This worldview is unrelenting in its pursuit of higher ideals, its desire to be filled with beauty, power, and splendor, to be shining and brilliant like the gods, to surpass the state of mere survival in which your life is nothing but a leaf in the wind. And here I have to return to one of the meanings of Aristos, which is superior, and for me invokes Nietzsche's Ubermensch. Of course, in Ubermensch, Uber means beyond, higher, or superior. Higher life, that is invigorated life, life full of health and energy, aims at the creation of supreme specimens. It always aims to overcome itself and to create something higher, to expend its energies. And the question of aims really is essential here. Life which aims at aristos, at mastery, at excellence, at quality, at always creating higher forms and higher states of being, will create those things over time. The aristocratic way of life creates quality. Higher life would rather die than settle for anything else. It would rather die like Achilles than settle for a base life, an ugly life, a mundane life of domesticity, a life of imprisonment and slavery. In contrast, the moral, progressive, utopian worldview aims precisely at the creation of domesticated life, and if it does not, then it creates domesticated life as a byproduct. If one's goal is material prosperity and comfort, which Achilles scorned, the alleviation of suffering, the removal of resistance and struggle in life, one creates a form of life which is weak and lethargic, incapable at aiming at anything higher, incapable of overcoming itself. It is through harsh discipline and through testing ourselves against the world in the struggle to gain mastery over it, in the struggle to be the best, that we are able to manifest our inborn potential and powers. If Achilles had stayed at home, we would not remember him, and the full potential of his nature, of his divinity, would not have manifested. When a society seeks to level the hierarchies of nature, to negate the inequalities which allow us to compete, it removes the potential for excellence and the potential for the creation of higher states of life. One creates a society which is like a zoo, a society which imprisons rather than elevates. The result is sick life, life which like many animals in captivity refuses to reproduce, becomes addicted to food and masturbation, becomes restless and seeks to destroy itself or resigns to a state of apathy and lethargy. This is precisely what we see happening all around us at a societal level today in the West. Generation upon generation we are breeding what Nietzsche called the last man. Since as of now the ancient aristocratic worldview has absolutely zero political hold anywhere in the Western world, and is in fact almost universally considered to be evil by both left and right, it is up to us to preserve the aristocratic way of life, to preserve higher life, 
first within ourselves, and one day on a societal level. This is why I named this channel The Ark. The liberal worldview is collapsing as its ideology proves itself to be incorrect on a very, very fundamental level. Its assumptions are wrong. And with its collapse, the West will be launched into chaos. Just to briefly illustrate this, mass migration has failed to create a harmonious multicultural society and has in fact created the opposite. Our economic policies have failed and are hurtling the West towards economic collapse. The principles of liberalism have failed to defend our societies and their constitutions from its more aggressive, derivative ideologies on the left. To put it concisely, a flood is coming like the earth has never seen before. But this also gives us one of the most supreme and meaningful tasks in history, to preserve and to rebuild, to be the founders of a new civilization to give birth to a new type of man, which is both of the pages of Homer and of the stars. To give birth to a new Aristos who shine with beauty, power, and nobility. To give birth to Nietzsche's Ubermensch.